Good evening, everyone. It is Idajo Live. It's Thursday, so that must be Thomas Idajo Live night. Yes, it is. It's great. Welcome. I have a very special guest tonight. Oh, by the way, Idajo Live is classical. No, Idajo is where classical music happens. I actually love that phrase. I, I'm, I know I haven't supposed to say it, but I love to say it because there is so much happening in the Idajo world. As you know, if you've been online and check it out, we've got the Idajo Live podcast in every form, a wonderful conversation with leading uh, authorities and, and responsibilities of the classical world as well as colleagues. We have, of course, the ever-growing, unbelievable streaming platform with over 15, 16, 17,000 classical composers. Now, I'm a classical musician. I didn't know there were that many classical composers, so knock yourself out. And, of course, we have the most extraordinary development called the Global Concert Hall, which is being used and signed up and planned by presenters and opera houses across the world over the next, well, for the next future of this, what I call the third rail of performing digital and analog at the same time. All of that we're going to talk about. I'm just saying good evening because what I really want to say is welcome Deborah Rutter, president of the extraordinary, well, I should say extraordinary president of the more extraordinary <laughs> Kennedy Center, old friend, wonderful colleague, Great to talk to you. You're in Washington. I'm in Zurich. Let's do it. I'd love to be in Zurich. I have to tell you, I would love to be anywhere, but right here in my home office here in Washington, <laughs> D.C. But it's great to be with you. So you are, okay, let's get to the chase. The, the Lincoln, I mean, you have had to cancel pretty much everything. I know you just had an announcement about the next season, but since Corona hit, since March, has, has Kennedy Center been dark? Uh, it has been completely dark. We have actually filmed two uh, performances that were broadcast on public uh, broadcasting system for both Memorial Day and uh, 4th of July. So we had a small wow. number of orchestra musicians from the National Symphony Orchestra <clears throat> and members of the chorus of the military choruses uh, come and perform and record on the stage, all very socially distant, appropriate. But those are the only things that we've had going on in the building since uh, May 13th. March 13. March, March 13. March 13. Exactly. That's when everything shut down. Uh, well, we'll, we'll we'll circle back to that. Ladies and gentlemen, what I thought would really be fun is that since I know Deborah and and she's in our in our industry, she's an enormously important person and has been for decades. Uh probably even a feared person and also probably for decades. No. <laughs> well, anyone that's carried the kind of responsibilities you've carried, you know, artists, we get we get easily spooked. So I'm just teasing Never. you. But, um, I, you know, what it's a real pleasure for you, people. What's that? What have I ever done to spook you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been lucky. I've never been spooked. And, oh, and we've okay. known each other for a <laughs> long time. We were talking about that. But I just thought it might be interesting for people to realize that first and foremost, somebody of your amazing stature and position and responsibility, you started life really as a musician. Did you want to be a professional musician? You know, that's a, a really great question. And I, I think you know this story, but I um, grew up in the San Fernando Valley in Southern California, just an ordinary kid with parents who loved classical music. We listened to the Met all the time on Saturdays. Uh, we um, listen to classical radio. We listen to classical music. My parents to this day are avid consumers yeah. in both analog and digital. Um, and I started playing the piano first and the violin. And then I just completely fell in love with playing the violin. But I, um, I don't know that I could say I'm a social person, but I really don't like that hours and hours and hours and hours and hours in the practice room. So um, I love the playing in an orchestra. I love playing chamber music, but I was not really dedicated. Um, but the story I want to tell you is that in eighth grade um, in middle school, uh, um, what they at that time called, no, they called it middle school then, um, a junior high school, uh, my eighth grade history teacher was Roberta Thomas, Michael Tilson Thomas's mother. <laughs> I just love that. It's just, a fantastic story. It. And of course, Michael is um, a, 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 a little bit older than I am. Uh, and he, he, No, so no, stop. He, Michael's a lot older no. than I <laughs> Michael exactly is 12 years older than I am. 
I love and it. So he was already uh, really getting to be well known, and in Southern California, he was conducting the Young Musicians Foundation Orchestra. So how, how old? How are you? How old is he at this time? He's. Oh, thank you very much, Thomas. No, 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 no. I know. Sorry. Yeah, age. you're right. Seven okay, stop, stop, stop. Don't do that. I'm not someone. <laughs> I was just. I actually was just going to kind of hook in what an incredible child prodigy he was, but yes. keep on going. Yeah. Let's leave no, Gates out of this. Hey, I've just had a birthday. I don't want to talk about. So just okay. keep on going. Um, and so uh, it it was really great because in the eighth grade, your apparently it's your world history teacher's responsibility to sort of do career planning. So she, um, as a part of this, asked the class, you know, each of us, what what did we want to be? So I was going to be either an astronaut. <laughs> a forest ranger <laughs> or a classical musician and that's when she revealed that in fact she was the mother of michael tilson thomas and this is how hard it is to be a classical musician and this is what it takes to be um a classical musician so what great. happened what happened to the astronaut yeah well i wasn't very good at this all that science either <laughs> Well, but I do I mean, love to go out camping and hiking and all of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when so when when somebody starts, I mean, you were passionate about the violin. In fact, the violin even brought you to Europe, right? Yeah. I mean, you absolutely. came to Vienna to study and you played it in an orchestra for a while. Yep. When one starts the violin and you know the hours and hours of practice, is that the same? Is that the same whether you're going to be a backbencher in a in an orchestra or a front bencher on a, on a in a lesser orchestra or or and and or if somebody whispers near actually you sound a lot like a young Heifetz or whatever that happens to turn you is it is the same process or or not? Uh, you know it's the same process absolutely it's the same process it takes those number of hours it takes that level of dedication um, and then it takes a lot of magic on top of it. I believe that each of our artists on stage, whether they're standing at the front of the stage as yourself or within the orchestra, they have uh, some bit of fairy dust, that magic that gives them the um, that which it takes to be on the stage. And right. um, I uh, appreciate the magic and I know how what it takes to have it. I always felt I was in a better position to do the work to support an orchestra um, uh, or an opera company because I was, uh, I had actually played in an orchestra, I played in an orchestra pit. I, I knew this repertoire and I loved it on my own. And I felt like I had, uh, while I didn't have that extra bit of charisma, there's a, an amazing woman who's so talented, who's a member of the second violin section of the Chicago Symphony. And I remember this story recently was before I left Chicago to come to Washington. And we were on tour, those times when you get to tell those great stories is when you're on tour. And it turns out she also was in the San Fernando Valley at the same time, but she didn't go to public school. She was homeschooled because she was studying already at USC oh, and getting that elite level of training yeah. uh, to then be able to have a career. And her teacher, wanted her to be on the front of the stage. She expected this woman to be a soloist. And that was the training that was expected of her, the training that she was receiving. And then she went off to Juilliard, et cetera. And she is a member of the second violin section of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. They're lucky to um, have her. They're lucky to have her. And, um, you know, people decide sometimes that they don't really want to be on the front of the stage. They want to be in an orchestra. Uh, and there are plenty of opportunities for solos, and she plays lots and lots of solos as well. But let's be really clear, it is a dedication of life, and and um, most of us really do understand um, what it, what that means. So piano just sort of stated as the study instrument? Piano became, you know, I think that's the part where I'm a social person, and I thought I loved playing in an orchestra. I loved being enveloped by an orchestra and the sounds of what that was really like. Even when you're in a school orchestra, um, eventually I got to be in better and better orchestras, but that even even in a, you know, a school orchestra, I loved it. So I gave up the piano until my daughter started playing piano. Never played it really at all. And then when my daughter went off to college, I started taking piano lessons again, so. Well, good for you. Yeah, I'm, 
Fantastic. I, love, I love it now more. I would practice lots more. <laughs> I, I love the focus. It's a fantastic experience. How do you, how do you, yeah, I mean, it's like in all your free time, you're practicing piano, right? Yeah, yeah, actually. Uh -huh. So let me ask you, I mean, you know, just flipping to that and, and going back to the contemporary situation, has the meltdown been as intensive a work time effort as maintaining the schedule? Absolutely. Uh, you know, in my daily life before the shutdown, I spent a lot of, I spent almost all my time with other people, uh, whether in one-on-one -on -one conversations or meetings, I've been in meetings with you, you know, they can be one-on-one -on -one or they can include five or six or seven people. Uh, in Washington, D.C., it is extraordinary the vibrant um, life, civic life of this city with the embassies and all of the different kinds yeah, of sure. programs that go on here. And then when you run a performance venue that has nine stages and now another 10 spaces, we have a lot of programming going on. So I'm at the center seeing programs every single night in one form or another. Um, so the diversity of what I um, did uh, up until March 12th um, was so exciting. And sometimes it was almost too much just because it was so interesting, That's so true. rich. Oh, it's um, intoxicating. Wow. I've been down there. I'm, I'm intoxicated when I'm in, in, in the Kennedy Center. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, get, make no mistake, Kennedy Center is one of the truly hallowed places in our country, uh, at both in mandate and, and in reality over the last decades. It's, it's an extraordinary institution with an extraordinary mission and an extraordinary charisma when you're there. So if you come to DC, you have to go to the Kennedy Center. Now, moving Thank along. Thank you. I, you know, I didn't think about this. Have you not, were you not allowed to work in your office at Kennedy Center? So I have been in, in these, uh, let's see, it's, we're in the eight, near the eight, end of the 18th week of working from home. The first two weeks I worked in the office. And so in the last 16 weeks, I have been there three times. Um, I go in now. So, to own the, the so you had to reroute all the phones and all the tech, everything else. So when, when I talk happened, to your assistant, exactly. he's it, at it home too. About four days. So all of our box office. So the really interesting thing is, is that when you have an organization with as many programs and activities, um, the volume of uh, activity that you have to then close down, the number of patrons that you have to speak to, the number of artists that you have to adjust plans. So it was uh, very fast. Um, I will tell you that we were not an organization that really had uh, enthusiastically embraced the concept of teleworking previously. And then it got to the point in those two first two weeks, we realized all of our box office staff needed to work from home. They were still coming into the office because that's where all the phones were coming in. Sure, but we sure. realized that all of their seats were too of close course. to one another. So every single um, box office, all of our IT, we had to have uh, laptop, laptops, cell, in some cases, cell phones, in some cases, internet connections for staff provided so that they could all work from home. It was wow. very, very intense, very quickly. What are you hoping is going to be the opening? So um, our plan is to have um, performances in, in something like what looked like the past beginning in January. Um, so wow. next, next week we'll gone. be announcing. We'll, next week we'll be announcing that uh, we'll start having some performances beginning in January at a very slow pace and then ramping up uh, through the spring. Um, something looking closer to this, um, probably by May, we'll be at about 70% level of activity. How many performances a year at the Kennedy Center? 1,538 last year. <laughs> 1,538. Next year, we are estimating 675. Yeah. So quite, quite significantly diminished. And what kind of online, uh, or what online presence do you have? So, um, you know, what's really interesting is before I got to the Kennedy Center, we like to joke that the website um, was a reflection of our namesake and uh, a, an internet based on when John F. Kennedy was born. <laughs> 
So I, didn't, I, it I didn't say it. I've never accused it you. It of... was so bad. Um, but the team has really. Uh, True. Uh, so over the last, I would say, the, la the in the last six years, up until about three years ago, it was really a slow process yeah. just because of the foundation on which it was built. We now have a completely new website. We have a completely new relationship. Our digital stage is yeah. exploding with activity. So we are doing daily programming. Um, we're doing uh, live programming uh, three days a week, but in a week and a half, we'll start doing it every live programming from across the country. Fun. So we're starting a brand new program called uh, Arts Across America, uh, uh, powered by Facebook. And it will be live every day and it will be different regions of America. As the National Cultural Center, it's not just about our orchestra or our opera company. It is that plus dance, jazz, Fabulous. all kinds of uh, all types of music, theater, etc. So, um, is it a new is this a new mandate, or does it fall in sync with Arts Edge? So, um, the learning program that you're mentioning is every single day we have content on our digital learning platform right. for students, teachers, families, because that has been even more necessary during this period of time, because parents are struggling, teachers are needing, what can we do online? So it is master classes, it is special talks, but it's actually curriculum for arts learning uh, online. So it's in parallel to that. Wow. So the, 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 one of the dear things that happened, so on the 12th of March, we had made the decision that the 13th, we were closing for, uh, uh, you know, we thought yeah. until May 10. And on the 13th in the morning, I got an email from Mo Willems, the famous author illustrator for young people's right. book. Right. And he said, I'm so sorry, I can't come there because he was, he was due to do a big program over the weekend with our artistic director of jazz, Jason Moran. And Mo said, I'd like to do something. How about on Monday, I start a program at one o'clock Eastern and it will be live from my home in New England, and I will teach young people to draw. Oh, and for the next three weeks, every single day at one o'clock, every single weekday at one o'clock, wow. Mo would be there, like Mr. Rogers, I'm telling you, and he would say, hello, Thomas, how are you today? Oh, would no, you no. like to draw? What would you like to draw? Would you like to draw a cow? How about we learn how to draw a cow today? So I would have known this. I would have watched him every day. Well, he, you I can can't draw to save my life. He, he, it is there, and we have kept it on our on our website. So go, go on back. to the digital learning uh, website. Yeah. yeah, it's been really, really rewarding to see who has been coming to see what on our website. So going back to the this is your life part of the of the of the conversation okay. and cutting catching up. You know, I, I tend to forget that because I was just a completely naive bumpkin from from Spokane, Washington. Uh, and that's not Spokane's fault. That's my fault. But I mean, it was, you know, when I came to Los Angeles, it was it was really a phenomenally new perspective of, of life. I come from rural cowboy corner country. My dad was a was a nuclear engineer and my mother was a cross between Lucille Ball and I don't know who else. Uh, so it was, it was what a, they created. Yeah, and and you know she was amazingly you know very creative. She's still with us. She just turned ninety. She's fantastic. Hi, mom. Uh, and and uh, dad's dad's building other things in another life somewhere. Um, but my point is, is it when I came to life, it was very heady stuff, and I came down to Los Angeles, actually through the the Music Academy of the West in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And 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 I'd met good friends there. And when I came to Los Angeles, I already was kind of in the USC music crowd. Right. And Natalie Demonic was there, and Armin Guzlimian was my was my best friend. We were working together a lot and so forth. So I was taken by the hand immediately to Dorothy Chandler and to all of these amazing events. And I remember I remember so clearly uh, Carla Maria Giulini the great Italian conductor who was the music director at Los Angeles. Now you must have worked shoulder to shoulder, paper to paper with him, is that? He started the same year. <laughs> Seriously. 
Well, well, he was the music director and I was, you know, the assistant to operations. But yeah, we started, both started in 1970s. But there was this extraordinary man who 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 was an extraordinarily powerful guy and bright guy, Ernst Fleischmann, right? And he's the one that, that discovered you. How did how did you get under his wing? Oh, that's... Uh, <laughs> and, and by the way, that's not a Me Too comment. That, no, yes, no, and, and he's good for that. That, that wasn't I, Ernst, ever. You know, it's pretty funny that you're asking these questions because uh, these are... Um, fun questions that you'll appreciate. I was very fortunate because I loved playing in their orchestra. I was introduced to the woman who ran the um, education programs at the center, at the okay. center, at Hollywood Bowl and I, at I, the I, Los Angeles Philharmonic. And she gave me a summer job at the Hollywood Bowl, the two summers while I was still in college. Wow. And at the end of the second year, um, I made myself handy in a moment when somebody needed to do something. And Ernest looked at me and said, that was smart. Why don't you come and work here? I said, well, that would be great, but I am going to finish college first and then I'll come and work here. And he said, okay, we'll see you next summer. But, so, but wait a minute, you're in college. I, have you already given up on having a future of the violin? or did yes, you, are you... yes, I was playing the violin and I was playing in orchestras and all of that, but I did not, I went to Stanford. I didn't go to a, a, a... And what did you take at Stanford? Public administration or? No, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, okay. I'm about it. I didn't then, you'll, then you'll, I, I, no, it, German studies. Oh, that's right. No, I, no, no, I know this. I know this is fantastic. That was and that was your main thing, German <laughs> studies. German right. Germanistic, German yeah. <laughs> Germanistic. Well, I'm a hobby Germanist. No, that's it. You know, I studied, I have a degree in political science. Oh, yeah. And and our paths really have such 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 kind of equanimity yeah. because I took I and I shifted from pre-law to public administration, thinking public administration is probably not very far from arts administration. And I love music. So if the thing doesn't work and I mean people say, Oh, you've got such a nice voice and you're so musical. And and so things are kind of I mean, I've always said my voice discovered me, and it's very true. I didn't I was never one of these, oh, I just gotta be on stage and I just love it. And oh God, give me this. I that wasn't where I was at. So I kept sort of discovering these various talents that I didn't really know that I had, but I knew that I had to have a backup plan. Otherwise, my father wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've done and, and that was one of them. So I'm just curious because you also, so you got, you went to Stanford, studied German. Did you have a, do you have a bachelor's or a master's in music? No, I, no, oh, I actually, love it. the story is that I took everything except sight singing and 20th century music. I love but it. I, but I had all of my other credits that I could cobble together from living in Vienna because I kind of screwed everything up by living in Vienna during my junior year for the whole year. And so my I just had all kinds of weird classes. So that's why I have this funny degree called German studies. That's okay, so when you come back and you've got the, and you and you meet, do you do you knew what a formidable person Ernst was when you met him? I had a good sense. I had a good yeah. sense of it because so that, it, that's why I, I had stepped into a void of need. Somebody needed to take care of something, and I, you know, yes, I did. Did I so know? So you, you were you were bright enough and good enough to know. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but he, he to his finger pointing at you was a kind of an aha moment for you, right? Yeah, yeah. but if you look back at that time, mm -hmm. he was hiring a lot of young people. So literally, I started when I was not yet twenty two years old. I was twenty one when I started working. But he had surrounded himself with a whole bunch of us, uh, other uh, young people, uh, all working there at the same time. Was he just simply passionate about young people and giving them the, giving them the start? I think he was that, and he was so difficult that perhaps <laughs> individuals who are older weren't prepared to put up with it. I was hired to work with a fantastic <laughs> man <clears throat> who had come back to the U.S. to work at, at, with Ernest and. It, it didn't work out so well because Ernest wants to tell everybody what to do, right? Um, and we as young people learned so much from him. I, I really, I, I absolutely say that I stand, have the job that I have today because Ernest Fleischman gave me that opportunity and gave me all kinds of uh, learning moments, both the ones that you learn to do and the things you might not want to do. When Ernest and you were around a formidable musical, I think we can say genius, certainly one of the most talented people, Carla Maria Giulini, but who was also intensely private, if I remember correctly. Uh -huh. 
uh, and a man of enormous aesthetic discipline. <clears throat> I'll tell you a story as well, but, but what, how, how, I know we're talking about the early eighties, but still it's the same thing. What, what is that like? I mean, is it, and I know there's a differentialness in there, but at the same time, very intelligent artists need people of reality around them to give them the, the check where you should or you can't do that. Did they, did they sort of roll their sleeves together and decide on what the season should be played and, and, and the politics within the orchestra? I mean, how does that work? Well, Ernest was, uh, Ernest lured Giulini to come to Los Angeles with the promise that Giulini was not going to have to do a lot of the traditional music director. So work. he brought Giulini. So he, oh, he is solely yeah. responsible for getting Giulini there. And Giulini really had enormous respect for him. But this um, gave him an opportunity to focus solely on the music for Giulini and the relationship with the musicians. And then Ernest really took care of all of the other stuff. So he would work through with Giulini what the uh, repertoire that he wanted to do and the projects that he wanted to embark on. And then Giulini would allow Ernest and the rest of the staff to take care of the rest of the season. This was at a, you know, we're talking the 70s and early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. Um, you know, the world was a little bit different. Ernest still had, I remember, you know, the book that had all of the flights. You could go to the OAG and it'll tell you all the flights, all the trains, schedules and everything. You're looking in something that looks like a telephone book, right? <laughs> And and so Ernest loved being involved with all those details. Uh, and I think about it today because my job is so completely different. And being even the top person in an orchestra, you would never be involved in all of the same level of detail. But Ernest loved it. That's where he wanted. He wanted to be in there discussing and debating string complements for wow. this particular symphony or you know, will you double the wins for the Brahms or, you know, he, he, that's he, the musician? he wanted to be involved in. Was Ernest a, a musician? Ernest was a musician. Ernest wanted to be a conductor. Ah. Ernest was a conductor. And I think he fancied himself also a little bit of, a, you know, orchestrator, arranger, con composer. Uh, so he was a, he, he was a Walter Leg type. Hugely knowledgeable, hu hugely. But he had also, like you, had a parallel training so that he was, uh, he was trained as a CPA. Oh my so God. he actually was really good with the numbers too. I can't even keep my 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 checkbook. Never mind. Thank God we don't have checkbooks okay. anymore. We you have, have you know, I remember checkbooks, but you know, we have these <laughs> wonderful programs that that you know, no, that doesn't that number doesn't add up, Mr. Hampson. Try again. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I think it's just. I think it's. I think people maybe somewhat sometimes underestimate how how. Um, fluid, flexible, how many various components are actually going on, many pieces are going on behind the scenes, you know, how many strings here, whether that person's up to the job, whether we need to relook at the woodwind section, not to mention, oh, well, let's do a Beethoven cycle. Oh, I can't sell a Beethoven cycle. Oh, yes, but what I really want to do is, I thought I put Beethoven Ligeti together because it, oh my God, no, we will never sell that. All that kind of stuff that goes into the moment we buy a ticket and sit down as an audience and Giulini walks out. I remember he always walked with the baton very ceremoniously, you know, out as if, as if there was, it was like Darth Vader's magic wand, you know, but I'm not that he was Darth Vader, but I do remember once with, you know, can I tell you, a friend of mine, Armin, took me to my first Verdi Requiem. And I had no clue. I knew. Oh, I you mean Giulini's Giulini's. Giulini. And we're talking Marti Talvela, Placido Domingo, Obratsova and Merede Freni. Right? I remember very well. Yes. And we're sitting there. I mean, I knew it was a big night. He got the ticket. We're sitting there. My, my, I'm just, I'd never heard anything like this in my entire life. Uh, and just before the Dies Irae, he said, you know, you might want to fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> you know, he said, this, this may actually, you know, because I, I, you know, being very excitable to music, he said, you, you need, be careful. You know, yep. and yep. and sure enough, this you know wrath of God ripped through the Dorothy Chandler, and and it looked like Giulini, in those moments, didn't break a sweat, mm -hmm. but you could just as if as if you could see this this laser of intense musicality and intention to the entire orchestra, just as if you could measure it. Is that is that was is that your remembrance of him? 
So what's extraordinary is we probably spoke to one another that evening because Armin and his brother Ara Ara. are very long time dear friends. Of course. And Armin, it, it family, very close family friends. And that I remember the that week of performances like it was yesterday. Wow. Uh, uh, partly for the learning moments and partly because it was my first Verdi Requiem live. Why? Of course it would be. I was probably 22 years old, right? Wow. Um, and well, maybe not. I, Zubin could have done it in the years that I was. I was a subscriber to the LA Philharmonic as a teenager. Um, but uh, I remember that performance myself. We were surely there together. Isn't that something? Really it, it, because you said it just before. I, I don't know if I, I always try and I, I, I always try and take and have an excuse for, for our public. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take you to screen sharing and we're going to go to the we're going to go to the iDodgio app. Now, the iDodgio app, the web browser, iPhone, iPad, Android, whatever you have, it all interlaces. It's all the same thing. So we're going to go to screen sharing. I'm going to check a couple of buttons here so we have the right sound. And we're going to go to iDodgio. And the next thing you're going to see, uh, other than us in smaller pictures, I've, I've pulled up already Beethoven Pastoral with the famous Carla Maria Giulini. And this is not a name that you hear so much anymore. Now, there's two things. We're just going to drop the, we're just going to drop the, should we just hit stop the, start the beginning? Yeah. The to beginning. get an idea of yeah. Giulini's wonderful excellence. Now, if you notice, ladies and gentlemen, over here, this is where we're going to play. And this is the name of it. And these are in playlists, which I love. And the playlists go with you wherever you want to go. But over here, since I've asked to look at the pastoral, in fact, it's already given me over here all the other recordings oh, yeah. in the Idajo database of the pastoral symphony. So you can drop your needle back and forth. Now I'll tell you the really fun thing is let's go to, let's go to, oh, that's a wonderful, wonderful beginning. It's just so awful to push that pause, but yeah. we're both just smiling. I mean, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we are, but the thing is, if you, if you, there's a, there's a weird here, I'm not going to waste your time, but, but actually you can actually buy, buy movement. Right. You can actually have all this as well. The Adagio app is quite a learning platform. And notice down here, you've got Michael Tilson Thomas with the English Chamber Orchestra. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And I'm sure yeah, he has his own. Fun Hollow would be good. That'd be good. All of those are amazing. I saw Muti down there too. Muti is down there. Of course, there's all sorts of them. But you know, I'm I'm it, it's not about being it's not about picking picky uni. I think that these kinds of things within the I Dodge up, what I would like to encourage people, and certainly I encourage my, my students, is to listen professionally. But you know, the idea of legato is an aesthetic question that migrates, mutates, metamorphoses through different epochs and through different understandings. Uh, and and somebody you know somebody will wrinkle their nose and say oh that's so old fashioned and they want to go to a modern I, I just don't quite see it that way I mean if I was sitting on here and I'll probably after our conversation come back and listen to session which I always try to do you know and drop the needle on somebody it's just it's a fun part of the Adagio app not just streaming music but actually you can really use it as your own learning platform now say you love this thing and you want to and you want to save it to a collection you just save it to collection so you can go over here and you go into your playlists. And you'll have a collection down here. It's got Giulini on here somewhere. 
uh, anyway, you, you can have a lot of you can have a, a lot of fun on the app. I'm gonna we have too much to talk about. I'm gonna just go back out. That was your learning that, that was your learning moment for your That playlist of yours is quite interesting. Yeah, there's some I've got some fun things in there, but Julie, you know who Julini, who would who the famous conductor today was his mentor was Myun Chung. Yeah. Myun Wung Chung, sorry. Myun Chung. A Myun, yeah. When I was there, Chung was the assistant conductor. Exactly. Michael Wilson Thomas and Simon Rattle were the principal guest conductors. <laughs> Simon Rattle. I had a good tutelage. I had a very Yeah, I have to tutelage. ask you, did you know Calvin Simmons? Of course I did. Wasn't that tragic? You know, Calvin conducted the Cozy with Rob, with with Jonathan Miller in the early '80s, and and that summer after that production that I was in, which is kind of a big watershed moment for me. But Calvin was the most extraordinary musician I'd ever met. I hadn't met Simon or or Michael. They were kind of you know rumors out there. But Calvin Calvin Simmons, he was a, he was an African American conductor. He was a contemporary of 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 uh, Simon. Do you know that he and Simon were at Glyndebourne in the summer together? No, Can you imagine how they, how they tore that place up? A story is abound, but I mean, <laughs> such a prodigiously talented young man and had a canoe accident, probably, you know, probably fell and hit his head, took him weeks to even find his body in Lake Palisades. It was absolutely, we were broken, broken hearted. We all became I so wonder, close. I wonder how classical music might have been different Can, racially if Calvin had lived. Can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, I mean we have a lot of wonderful uh, black, um, we have a lot of African-American conductors and I worked, Willie Waters was with me in Maryland and so forth, but they all had different trajectories. Right. Simon Simon Rattle and Michael Dizzen Thomas and Calvin Simmons are all the same DNA. It's just, you know, it's just it, kind of, you know, kind of extraordinary. And Calvin, you know, I remember watching Calvin Simmons one night in, in St. Louis play a game with the head of Edinburgh Festival, Diamond was his name. I don't remember John Diamond, I think was his name. And so the, and he was also an incredible musician, a bit like like Ernest Fleisch and knew the repertoire inside out. And so they were having a I'll give you I'll give you a three note theme and you tell me where it comes from. I hate games like that. I mean, I mean, I just sat there with my mouth and they went on and on and on. And I mean, oh, the second second movement of the string quartet in F major and the, and the, oh, that, oh, that, oh, that's an easy me. I try different. That's the XP, that's the, that's the development of the third movement of the second symphony. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I thought I'd lose my mind. I, I realized, I realized the food chain very quickly. You know, I was thinking about this in anticipation of uh, this conversation today. I was thinking about moments and people who had been really influential and different eras. And it's really interesting to think about who are going to be the individuals we talk about uh, from the era that we're living in right now. So we were both really young at that time. And certainly there are young people in uh, the classical music world. Who are they going to be? Uh, speaking about, they'll be speaking about Simon Rattle the way we were just referring to Carla Maria Giulini, of course, even though, Probably. let's be clear, Probably. Simon is still younger than Giulini was at that time. All Although right. maybe not too much, you know. I was 22, so Giulini was probably in his early 60s, and he seems so old. Ah! <laughs> but so uh, Simon was... might just be the Giulini of our era, right? And, right. Um, so you know, it's, it's a it's fun game. It's a it's a fun game to play. It it also belies the question of what of what engagement young artists have today with the world that they're going into or want right. to go in into, and and whether they're focused on those particular amazing, especially live moments. I mean, we went to concerts. We you know that's <laughs> PBS. Right. You know, I'm, I remember clearly watching uh, Seiji Ozawa and the Mahler, Mahler cycle on PBS. But other yeah. than that, you know, America has never been real big on. Well, that's not true. In the in the 40s, they were much bigger. But that's another conversation. But you know what I mean? I mean, I that know exactly what you mean. That's why Adagio is so important for our, us. But I wish we also had even more of the visual. Uh, to be able to share because you know our world is so visual now youtube yeah. gives us a lot but it doesn't well, really give us enough and you don't get the the essence of the live performance in quite the same way i don't know do you see the kennedy center moving toward a, a, a higher digital profile we do a lot and i'm really proud of the national symphony orchestra and the volume of activity that they have on our website on medici tv 
as well and um, uh, and certainly just on our Facebook page. So they are doing more and more live full performances. In fact, I think it's not this weekend, but next weekend, next Friday, uh, we will have a full, um, uh, we'll begin having regular full performances of the National Symphony on our website. Wow. You know, the fidelity, the visual, it's not the same as a live performance. Um, and uh, we just, there's nothing like a live performance, whether it's a, a small ensemble or a large ensemble like a symphony orchestra and the complexity and the, the sort of miracle of the music. I, I mean, I'm sure we agree on this and just need to say it one, again, just what you said again, that I think we both believe that, you know, the lid's off and, and we can't have enough digital and it's fantastic, but it is all about an augmentation, a support, a focus that still embraces the Holy Grail, which is human beings with other human beings and human beings playing for those human beings and those human beings giving that breathing, living feedback, yeah. you know, it's human, human, human. In all my career, well, I have been asked the question because let's remember when the tape player was replacing <laughs> the LP and then the CD was replacing it. Mini so discs. I've always been asked, mini discs. I've always been asked the question of will will technology replace the live performance? And I, I I stand by this today and I live it every day. Well, maybe not in these 18 weeks that the digital, uh, the technology is an augmentation and an introduction, but right. it never replaces the live performance. Amazing on ramp. You and I are having a great conversation. We would still rather be sharing a cup of coffee or a glass of wine as we have almost every summer, one way or the other for the last number of years. And we need to be able to do that. People crave it. And yeah. so there is, um, there is this folklore or maybe legend that says, oh, the performing life is uh, waning away because everybody's going to digital. No, digital is enhancing the experience, but it will not replace it. Um, uh, it and I think, it's, I think it's here, I think that enhancing process, that's what I meant in my introduction, this third rail, we are now, when certainly Idajo's mandate is to produce for the, the, the analog audience, meaning physical people, whatever that may be is allowed. If it's 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people, that's, that's one thing. But at the same time, the digital experience will be a produced digital experience so that the digital experience till now has been a picture of that. And now we're actually in a phase where we're actually creating content and interactivity, uh, uh, so that so that so that people can you know have have a sense of participating in that performance. I have a, I have a question for you. I do have one business question moving forward that that it'd be interesting. You know, there's in in the in the in the pandemic there was just a great opening of the archives and the catalogs, and and there was an enormous flood of incredible giveaway, incredible quality material giveaway, even some things impinging on what somebody like me would consider a very modest revenue source. Other people may have made a lot more money in that. And that was immediately decided to be giveaway. And that's fine. I don't think that's, that's the problem. Moving, you know, the question is, can we put that genie back in the bottle? Should we put that genie back in the bottle? Do you think that our public, or at least a significant part of the public, would like to feel they're participating in the livelihood as the artist by paying something to have a, yeah. di even a digital experience? Yes, I do. I think that, that this is a part of the ongoing learning. And I think that while there are some uh, actions that uh, uh, belie the future and say, well, once you've done this, you can't go back. I actually believe that this will lead ultimately to the development of really high quality content and that high quality content is something that you can have a paywall for and that paywall will be embraced because we um, want to support the artist but i will right. tell you that there's something really miraculous that we have learned in some of our study and market survey that i am really encouraged by which is that the individuals who are using our digital content Many, like just under 50%, so a large number, have never been there before. Don't wow. know the artists, could be from all over the country, not just local, 
and are far more diverse racially. And this is because they are sampling and trying. We're all at home, we're all doing this. It is the audience that we have. Actually, this is a huge audience development moment for us. And if we give everything away because we can say, this music is for you. You didn't know that you love this music, but listen to it, it's gorgeous. Um, you didn't have it maybe as a part of your education because that would be easy. So many now have it. But um, the diversity of those who are going on and sampling our website and sampling the content there, whether it is the digital learning or the National Symphony Orchestra or the clips from any number of other kinds of programs, it's really interesting who's coming in. So That's I think that there, there are several important strategies to, to track here. One is create some content, put up a paywall, and develop it, understand that it, you're not going to get the same volume that you might otherwise. I mean, let's let's be clear, Mo Willems, I had people all over the world writing to me saying, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. But if we had put up a paywall at the very beginning, we wouldn't have yeah. had the millions of people yeah. following. So you do provide a service when you do this, but you have to be remembering that artists are providing this. So that's why we are paying our artists when we create a live performance. Um, so whether or not we're receiving revenues, we are um, making paying an honorary to the artists. I don't want to I don't want to bang on that drum too hard, uh, yeah, although right. it needs to be banged on. You know, the this this crisis, the, the checkbook is being seriously balanced on the back of of freelance artistry across the world uh yeah, you know the the, exactly the, right. the the contractual relationship called force majeure is is being stretched beyond every possible legal dimension that it was probably intended for in the first place and and it's it you know it's 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 the younger generation i mean i'm, I'm very involved in 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 pedagogical programs that well, that i run in in heidelberg and university of michigan and berlin and so forth and so forth you know i've had had these tough conversations with them and said look your career trajectory had just took a left turn i don't care how you want to look at this last three four months your life is not the same and it will not be the same as it was even in january so let's let's look at that and and first of all you have to survive as human beings and then then we'll get on past that as as artists and musicians um are you uh, are there are there young artist programs within the kennedy center outreach uh, that are that are giving platforms for the young people to perform so the Young Artist Program of the Washington National Opera right. is a program that is se separately funded from the rest of the opera. Oh. And we therefore kept it going all the way until the end of its term, which was the end of, I think, June. Maybe it was a few weeks earlier than that. And so they continued to receive their stipend and uh, living expenses for that period of time. And we're about to sign our contracts for next year's Young Artist Program. Wonderful. For, their, for that stipend. Now, mind you, we have an opera season that we planned for next year. And we're now saying, what are we going to be able to do? And how are we going to be able to support it? And it's really hard because there are people all over that are not working. who are working and getting reduced salary or not. Or not um, in, in some cases, it's it's a devastating circumstance and i think it's a, a really big learning lesson for all of us um i remember uh, being invited to come and speak to uh young artists in an entrepreneurial program and the first thing i said is look at them it's like at, you're at the beginning of your career can you please start saving money now <laughs> oh, and none of them really, they, all of them said what does two two plus two equals what again can you remind me like you know I what? Think I you know, what, you know who told me that i was rather down the road already i i was fortunate to be to be somewhat friends with van Clyburn, mm. and i was over at his house and it's a beautiful house you know and he got it from his fit he was very close with Collis, and he was sitting the memorabilia in his house was just amazing you know and so i asked him i said van how, how does this work i mean and and you did you haven't been playing and all because well you know tom my daddy told me when i started out he said you know son you're probably gonna make a lot of money. So why don't you just be sure and take 20% of whatever that is and just tuck it away because you might need it later. 
And so he said, I did that. I tucked that away. And after a while, daddy came to me and says, dad, son, you, you've tucked away quite a little bit of money. Shall we buy, shall we buy some property? <laughs> you know, I mean, yes, kids save money, time, discipline, money, discipline, as well as notes. You know, this is all part of right. your life. Good yeah. advice. I'm glad you said that to them. It is, it is, uh, it's tough in your first jobs and your first moments, oh. but um, yeah, and, and you're constantly being stretched, but these, you, who knew that we would be coming up against this? All right, two more, two more questions. One I have, and I know you got to go, and I really appreciate you taking all this time. It's wonderful to talk with you, and I wish we could have a wine, but the first question is also a little bit on the edge that I, I just need. We've had the pandemic crisis. We've had the economic meltdown. We've had everything we've talked about tonight, but we have also, as Americans, and even though I'm over here, I'm an American, and I have lived through and am living through in a tremendously compassionate, learning way, another level of racial indignation, in my opinion, completely and wholly justified and has been for some time, just to full disclosure here. I have been for years as a singer saying, one of the most miraculous evidences of American culture is the African-American canon of classical music and poetry, so forth and so on. You, I believe, at Kennedy Center have reacted to this and have implemented some new programs. You've, you've hit, you've, you're trying to be very pro proactive. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And, and what kind of conversations behind the scenes with your boards and so forth is, is it a general feeling that, yes, we need to do something about this? So the, the, the really, I mean, let, let's start by just saying this has been a devastating period of time. Yeah. The pandemic then followed on by the, the trauma and the tragedy of what we've been experiencing and what we've been witnessing um, in some ways, because we are housebound, we're all paying that much more attention. And I think it's so overdue that it's actually good that we're all finally paying attention in this particular way, because this is not the, this is not the first and most shocking, but this is the continuing drumbeat of a really uh, a tragic situation that we have that is, centuries old not decades exactly old. um the the one of the best things that happened to me when i came to the center was i had um a number of board members who said okay you say that you're the national performing arts center but as i look at it it only looks like you really only do symphony opera and um, ballet because that's what your website looks like and I said, well, no, we do more than that. But then I looked at the website and then I looked at what was the visible, most obvious programming that we offered. And I went back to my team and said, we have to change this. I know we all believe it, but we have to change it. It's also true that 20 plus years ago, we really started a new program called Performing Arts for Everyone with the sort of idea that it's a new millennium and we really need to do something but not really knowing for sure what, but over time, literally this institution has been dedicated to the concept of performing arts for everyone. So over the last six years in my era, we have diversified the programming. We have focused on school programs in this region because we were focused on them all over the country, but not in our own region to the same degree. And then ultimately expanding <laughs> the development of the new spaces at the Kennedy Center, the footprint for inviting others in our region and from around the world to practice their art, whatever that art might be, with no judgment. Two years ago, we brought a new artistic advisor um, for social impact to the center. Mark oh, Lee wonderful. Lee. And he has um, taken us on a very exciting journey of um, really understanding what our impact can be. And so in just these last months, we've been able to say, okay, this is what our learning has been in the last two decades. How will we build on it and how will we resource it so that we can pivot in this moment to be really servicing our country in this way? So we have, as a part of an eight channel effort around um, social impact. One of those specifically is called Black Culture Matters. And it's about focusing Wonderful. specifically on uh, Black artists and their stories and their art forms. But through all of it is woven the concept that we need to represent all Americans and their stories. 
One of the other ones that I think will be interesting to this audience is something called the, uh, the Cartography Project. Hmm. And this is a, a project that is going to mirror the concept that um, there are individuals who have lost their lives all across our country. We will find an artist to represent through opera, classical music, wow. other art form to commission a work so that you could say George Floyd will be remembered not just for the protests now, but through this work of art. And it will tell the story of Minneapolis and George Floyd. And it could be any number of individuals around the country. Are you working with Are you working with Brian Stevenson in the and Equal Brian, Justice Initiative? So this is exactly what the inspiration was. I wasn't love him. everybody would understand. Oh but the idea, it's exactly, the, we got this idea last fall when, when we went to see the Legacy Museum and the Equal uh, Justice Initiative, um, the memorial there. And the idea that you remember an individual uh, in that particular way, we will do it through the performing arts. Uh, so it's our form of that. I don't want to be morbid, but I've, I've made this suggestion before. I, I've signed up as, a, as just a member. I've never met the man. I, I know people that work with him and I, you know, I, I just admire him enormously. And I think the initiative is amazing and his TED Talks, everyone should, you know, if you want to get yourself up to speed, you know, what we're talking about here, go see Brian Stevenson, B-R-Y-A-N Stevenson on TED Talk and, and let him, you know, or, or simply go see the enormous movie. I'm sure you've seen as well. I am not your Negro mm -hmm. uh, with the, with the writings of, of, um, um, oh, I'm just had a blackhead. James, come on, talk to me. The right, ah, oh, come on. I, I can't believe I'm doing I don't this. Know this one, but I right. thought you were talking about the current movie that was, is about just mercy. James Baldwin, sorry. James right. Baldwin, yes. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Anyway, what I want to say was something completely different, and that is you've been to Vienna, and, and, and recently you know Vienna very well. At some point, somebody was brilliant, and I don't know if you know, if you go down the Linke Wien Seite, which is next to the next to the, 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 the sidewalk in front of the Theater on de Wien, as it were, Theater on de Wien, and you'll notice on the sidewalk are brass plaques. Yes. Brass plates. And those brass plates are the names, engraved in them, are the names of the, of the Jewish families that were taken from their house in that building that is still yes. standing and sent to some awful place. My feeling is, if we, insofar as we possibly could, I think the trees that have the lynches on them should have plaques and how many people were there. I think the places where these people were killed, murdered by, by these self-righteous bigots. I mean, I get a little worked up and I apologize, but I just, you know, I, I, we yeah. just cannot forget. Right. So that's our version of exactly that story. And to be able to do it in the nation's cultural, cultural center and to do it in a way that we can spread it around the, the country would be even more powerful. I hope there's some way that a elder statesman still singing, having fun musician can somehow be part of that. Just, That's you know, great. day in 24 seven, you know my number. Last question, you are a workout fiend. Every morning you are on your machine and you're making your phone calls and looking at your ass. Do you listen to music while you're working out? I don't. I was going to ask you what's on your iPod or I don't. I, don't. I don't. I actually, my new system, because my gym has been closed, uh, my new system has been walking the dog. I, my, I walk, my, my poor dog is so skinny now because she's, she's walking <laughs> miles and miles and miles every day. But I tend, I tend to listen to the news and think pieces as podcasts have never been a part of what I've been able to have time to do. So I've been listening to podcasts like this. I'm, I've become, I'm a big podcaster. Okay. But still the other question is, I mean, you have so much music, you've had a bit of a withdrawal now. Yeah. I mean, your life really is born for musical passion, isn't it? Right. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So what's your go-to? I, what is, I, this, what is I, the piece you keep depends, going back? It depends on the time of day. Okay. Because um, I, you know, the pastoral symphony I teed up for you because this was one of the first symphonies I played in an orchestra that I felt was a grown-up uh -oh. orchestra, and I I loved it, and I played the second violin, and I was just like I can remember it so so fervently. So it really depends on the time of day. Like 
if it's cocktail hour, if it's cooking dinner hour, then it's going to be Frank Sinatra or Ella or if, oh. if you're sitting on the patio and you're um, grilling, then you listen to Chicago because <laughs> I love the band Chicago. Ah. I mean, talk about great it, instrumentation. Oh, my God. That. that generation of rock music was just, you know, they were all Juilliard drops out. Yeah. Well, and the Eat other day I was, I was listening to a podcast about a young singer who lives in L.A. and she was talking about all of the great rock and roll stars who still live in California. And of course they were all the ones that I was listening to because I was working at the LA Philharmonic and then I'd go off and hear all these great bands in LA. It was fantastic. So it really depends on the time of day, but you know, what has always been my source of, um, of, of re finding myself again is sort of the meditation of being able to go into the theater and hear a performance. Mm -hmm. And I um, sort of listen to Giulini and Beethoven takes me to a place. Mm. But if I'm in the concert hall listening to Beethoven, um, it takes me to another place, which gives me in a, you know, a sense of personal um, a comfort and reflection. Um, but I, you know, Mahler symphonies right there. And, and Mahler songs. Sir, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I, I, have to, I have to tell you, I gave a recital on Mahler's birthday, first time I worked since yes. February, July 7, and it was a live performance, limited audience in Zurich here. And I found myself, even at the intermission, thanking them that I had the privilege of having Mahler's musical blood run through my veins again. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I mean, I think that's where so many of my colleagues, we're all, and I know you feel the same way, yet we're in a holding pattern. We're all trying to be responsible and so forth, but we can feel that people need, you know, what I do is is make things audible. It's not about me being in front of people. Right. It's about the sharing moment that something infinitely more interesting and greater than a Thomas Hampson or a, or a Deborah Ritter happens and, and people's lives are exactly right. innervated, enlivened, you know, uh, it's my new motto, by the way, enable, empower, and embrace. Embrace, yeah, well, the embracing. A Mahler song, a Mahler symphony really is a lifetime. Each time, whether it's one of the big long ones or a shorter one, each one is a, a lifetime that you experience. And it's, um, there's nothing like it, nothing like it. You wanna hear a wonderful quote of Mahler, paraphrase in English, along that line to close this out. After all, a human being is simply an instrument on which the universe plays. That's right. Isn't that wonderful? That's, right. That's exactly right. And Deborah Ruder, you make that possible. You're leading one of the most important artistic institutions in the world. You are a, a you are at the head of, of a flag that needs to wave across the winds of the world to remind us of the ideals, the fundamentals, the rightness of the American experience and experiment. And God knows that is under as much tension and tribulation as it probably has ever been. And the good news, ladies and gentlemen, this too shall pass and we shall move on. We will solve this. And I'm not being negative. I'm not being pointed about any particular person. I'm saying that the volatility of American culture has always been enormous patterns of volatility that find a reasonability. We are all extremely worried that the reasonability hasn't shown up yet. <laughs> but that's very true. If the arts have any responsibility to that and, and leadership like you, Deborah Rutter, we have a fair chance that it will show up soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. So fun to be with you. It's wonderful to see you. And I, I, I don't know when we get to fly across the yeah, water wait again. To have that glass of wine with you. We're about due right now. Oh, we're very due. Anyway, all Thank love. You. Thank you so much. Love to you. Ciao.